Welcome to the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast. My name is Natalie Nidham. I'm a nutritionist, a human potential, and epigenetic coach, and I created this podcast to bring you the latest ways to take control of your health and longevity. We cover it all, from new technology to ancestral health practices, personalized interventions, and a very special interest of mine, peptides. Enjoy the show. Welcome back for another episode. Today's topic is fast becoming one of my favorites. It's on my new favorite supplement, probably the biggest game-changing supplement I've come across in a long time. Uh, We're going to be talking about spermidine again. If you've been listening to this podcast for a few months, you will have heard about spermidine already. I I interviewed Leslie Kenny from Oxford HealthSpan in December, um, pretty close to when they were launching their supplement called Primadine. And it is one of those supplements, I have to say, that is really quite remarkable in terms of how materially it produces changes in people, like from 80-year-olds who notice that their hair is getting thicker to people in their 50s whose nails all of a sudden stop breaking or their skin looks better or their hair also is getting thicker. But what's most impressive about spermidine is the under the hood benefits. So it's the fact that it addresses five of the nine markers of aging. Um, The fact that it helps to support immunity and autophagy and protects DNA and helps your proteins to fold properly, which means that then they can function. So Not that this is a pitch on spermidine, but it is a pitch on spermidine because like I said, I do find that this one supplement seems to produce the most visible results in the most number of people. And the product we talked about in at the end of last year was Primadine by Oxford HealthSpan. And once again, we're talking about that same supplement because Amy Lamott is actually the cl- a clinical advisor to Oxford HealthSpan. So she comes to it from a much more technical um, and in-depth perspective, if you will. She is a clinical nutritionist and a researcher specializing in personalized nutrition, nutritional biochemistry, as well as nutritional genomics. And her other areas of interest also include nutrition for anti-aging, circadian biology, and the microbiome. So all the things, right? She has a master's of science in human nutrition from the University of Bridgeport. And, and this is the kind of interesting part that might get you to perk your ears up a bit. She's also a lawyer. She graduated from Yale Law School um, long before she took this different tack and decided to go into nutrition. So we talk a little bit about that story and that um, somewhat surprising transition at the beginning of the podcast, but then we dive right into what is both becoming one of my favorite topics and is one of her favorite topics, and that is spermidine. So if you decide that you want to give Primadine a try yourself, you can use promo code BIONAT15 and get 15% off your order of Primadine, and that's primadine.com, or you can look up Oxford HealthSpan Limited, and you will find Primadine there as well. And Primadine is just the way it's spelled, Prime which A-D-I-N-E at the end. If you are looking to connect with Amy, you can connect with her on Instagram at Amy Lamott. And her Instagram feed is fantastic. You will learn so much from her. She's always digging into different studies and picking them apart. And most importantly, making them relevant and understandable for the rest of us humans. Um, And then also she's on Clubhouse, I think also at Amy Lamott. And then if you're looking to connect with me or if you have any comments or questions about this podcast, you can find me on Facebook in the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Group or on MeWe at the same name, Biohacking Superhuman Performance Group, or you can reach out to me directly by sending me a note through my website, natnidham.com. Last but not least, you can always just go find me on Instagram, which is my name, at Natalie Nidham. So thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate you guys. Enjoy the interview, and I can't wait to hear back and find out what you thought. Talk to you soon. Hello, and very early good morning to you, Miss Amy Lamott. Nice to meet you in person, finally. Hi, Natalie. It's so great to finally meet you. I know. So, guys, we've been talking. Amy and I have been talking back and forth for 
I don't know, I guess ever since Leslie and I almost got back in touch um, about primidine and spermidine specifically. And um, and so we finally get to meet face to face today, even though you guys don't get to see the video because we don't post video anymore. Um, this is our first face to face meeting. So I'm, it's a pleasure to meet you, Amy. And uh, the power of the Internet, right? You're in Hong Kong. I'm in Toronto. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad we could find a time that worked for both of us. No kidding. Well, it's thanks to you being willing to get up like in the super early morning and uh, hop on a call with me. So this is great. So um, today we're going to continue the conversation on spermidine, which is the active ingredient or the main ingredient, if you will, in this new supplement called Primidine by Oxford Health, which was brought to market by a very good mutual friend of ours, uh, Leslie Kenny. So, but Amy... Why don't you tell us a little bit first about what role you play with Oxford HealthSpan, actually is the name of the company, not Oxford Health, um, and how we how it is that you came to be working with Leslie and why we're here today. So Leslie and I actually met a long time ago in 2002 in Hong Kong. And at the time, I was actually working as a lawyer. And she, she I think, was working in finance. So her background is business and my background is law. Okay. And what we didn't know at the time um, was that we both had autoimmune conditions, um, but neither one of us had been diagnosed at that stage. And Leslie ended up leaving Hong Kong and went on her own path to do other things. And in the interim, we both got diagnoses of autoimmune conditions. In my case, it was Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And I think we both being similarly minded decided, well, I'm not happy with just saying there's nothing I can do about this. And we both went on to reverse our autoimmune conditions. And I got so interested in the science around it that I went on to go do my master's of science in nutrition. Wow. So and you left law. I, I completely left the law. Um, yeah. Law was part of my problem, unfortunately. <laughs> part of the autoimmune immune condition. <laughs> the lifestyle was, was part yeah. of the autoimmune condition. But then Leslie and I reconnected because we both realized that we were back in a similar field. So she was in Oxford now, and I'm still in Hong Kong, and we're both working in sort of nutrition and wellness, and we reconnected, and she had started Oxford HealthSpan, and she asked me if I would join her clinical advisory board, and I said, of course, this looks really interesting. Wow, that's amazing. So, okay, so you went back and did, you said your master's in? What nutrition. Was in nutrition. nutrition. Okay. And did you focus on any area in specific or was it nutrition in general, clinical nutrition? What was your, what was your main focus? So the master's I did is very much in clinical nutrition, uh -huh. but I've always been interested in the research. So I was a very early adopter of looking at nutritional biochemistry and nutritional genomics, which I think is an interesting field. As long as we look at it always together with testing and seeing what's actually happening in the human body, it can yeah. be very helpful. Yeah, no. And guys, if you haven't already done so, you need to follow Amy on Instagram because she has one of the most, in, like your Instagram account is like going to school, that your <laughs> posts are like, they're so well thought out. They're so informative. Like it's such an incredibly balanced and informative view of things. I, I really have to say it's, I love your account. <laughs> Go check it out every day. It's like my dose of science. Every, no matter what I'm doing, I'm I'm get, at least getting that every single day. So anyway, so Len, let's. So did you first come across polyamines through Leslie, or had you come across polyamines before Leslie in your research? How did how did all this um, all this business? So polyamines, just so we're all clear, is spermidine is a poly, polyamine. So that I'm getting to the spermidine part, but. <laughs> So, so I was first introduced to polyamines when I was doing my master's because, you know, of course we study amino acids and polyamines are just derivatives of amino acids. But at the time, because we had a clinical focus, you know, our textbook basically said, well, you know, polyamines are really interesting and they're involved in, you know, cell growth and differentiation and a very important part of human health. The problem is right now, that being able to measure these clinically is not readily available. 
So stay tuned. And, you know, this should be coming any day now because it's so important to human health. <laughs> right. <laughs> And, and I, 20 years. And I, yeah. And I actually went and um, emailed my professor from that class because he, you know, his background, he has an amazing background. He studied with some of the people who discovered vitamins, you know, he, stu- he studied with Roger Williams who, dis- who discovered folate and B5 and B6 oh and all of the vitamins, you know, and then he went on to the national institutes of health and he worked there. And then he went on to, you know, start up Metametrics lab and then Genova. So he, I mean, he's a, an amazing guy. Yeah. And he said, you know what? There's still not any way, you know, outside of a laboratory setting where they're doing studies, no one can access these tests clinically yet. Okay. As far as he was aware. Right. Yeah. So I can't go get my, my levels checked at this point. No. And, and, you know, that's the same problem, I guess, right now with autophagy. Yeah. Because it's not like, you know, we, we say we do all these things to upregulate autophagy, and in studies, they've proven that it's happening, but you know, it's not like you can sort of fast for 24 hours and test your levels and see where you are. No. Right. And I would imagine different people get there at different times, depending. It's just like people get into in a ketogenic state at different, different, yeah. in, in different timings, depending on their glycogen stores or any number of factors in their body. Right. So, yeah. And there was that interesting study that just was released about exercise and autophagy. Did you see that one? No, it was very small, but they showed that women and men might um, have different effects in terms of when autophagy would be triggered and when autophagy would start and in what tissues. So they were looking at different types of exercise and how exercise triggers autophagy. Mm -hmm. So they were looking at hit exercise versus, you know, kind of more moderate exercise. Yeah. And then they were looking at muscle cells and things like lymphocytes and and monocytes. And they could see that in men, HIIT exercise was triggering it both in muscle and in these white blood cells. But in women, it was not. I think it was in muscle for women, but not in the white blood cells. And they were saying that estradiol is actually an inhibitor of autophagy, which is something I never knew before. And it makes sense because if we go back to this concept that, you know, you you need this cell growth, you know, when you, when the lining of the uterus is sort of building up, yeah, you know, you don't want to contrary to autophagy. So, you know, I think there's, there's a lot we just don't know yet. And it'll be really interesting to see where the studies go in the next few years. Yeah. Because then you would, yeah. So that would be very interesting, right? Because both from a, you'd be looking and with women, of course, you have to look at all these different populations of women. You have to look at premenopausal women, and then you have to look at postmenopausal women. And then you'd look at postmenopausal women that are doing hormone replacement therapy. Would that actually, you know, at what level might you inhibit autophagy, which would be a massive blow to all of us biohackers? (laughs) Yeah, it makes it makes you wonder if you should be cycling, you know, the BHRT. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. Oh geez, <laughs> really? <laughs> but of course, we don't know. This is all speculation. All right. Okay, I'm going to go with a simple-minded approach that everything's <laughs> fine for the moment, <laughs> for the time being. Okay, so Leslie approached you, said, "Would you sit on our board?" And you said, "Absolutely." And then what? No, so now I, I I I am involved with what they're doing, and it's it's a lot of fun. I helped Leslie write a white paper, which is something that we give to physicians that talks about the research for spermidine. I'm I helping that. them that's with a, some. That's a great document, <laughs> by the way. I know I'm not allowed to share it, but it's a really good document. <laughs> Thanks. And um, we also have a couple of new products in the pipeline, which I can't really talk about yet, but it's very exciting. A couple of new products will be coming out probably next year or this year, yeah. 2021. Yeah. Um, and one thing I can briefly touch on is that Oxford is putting together a symposium of some of the top scientists in the field of aging. And some of that is going to be closed door, but some of it is going to be open to the public. So that's something to sort of watch out for in the next few months. Oh, that's amazing. And so you guys will be in Oxford as in Oxford Health or Ox- HealthSpan or Oxford? 
Oxford University. Oxford University. But, but, but Oxford Health Span is very involved in putting it together. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, that's really exciting. Okay. So let's get to the business of spermidine. So some of the people listening to this podcast will have heard the first podcast that I recorded with Leslie Kenny on primidine back in the fall of 2020 or around the, the end of the year in 2020. This is really a follow-up podcast because Leslie felt that as a researcher and in your position as a scientific advisor to the company, you'd be able to talk about different aspects of, of, of spermidine and the method, method of action and whatnot that she wasn't really that comfortable just from her perspective addressing. So this is what this podcast is about, you guys. So if you haven't listened to the first one, you don't have to have listened to the first one to the, listen to this one, but that one would have given you... Um, a different kind of perspective on this whole story of spermidine and spermine and where it all comes from and the whole nine yards. But let's talk a little bit about the mechanisms of action. So one of the things that's so exciting about this supplement is, you know, the idea that spermidine might or is involved, or it's believed that spermidine is involved in these five hallmarks of aging, of which there are nine. Right. So, and I always miss one. I know that there's, it, it, it seems to address the misfolding of proteins that happens as we age. Um, it seems to address DNA repair. Um, it addresses, it seems to help to upregulate autophagy, which of course is very important for cellular renewal. And I'm starting to fade. You're going to have to jump in right now and help me out on the next two. <laughs> So, so technically the, the paper that Leslie always refers to in terms of spermidine specifically, they say that it helps with epigenetic change, impaired proteostasis, which is what you talked about in terms of protein folding, yeah. um, mitochondrial dysfunction right. is a big one, yeah. stem cell dysfunction and impaired intracellular communication. Right. So no, autoph so, but, uh, so autophagy is not there necessarily. Directly. Autophagy is not on the list of the hallmarks of aging, but obviously it's connected. Right. And then there's this whole other idea of sen cellular senescence, which again is not officially on the spermidine list, but it's a question mark right now, right? Yeah. I, I think cellular senescence, there are other compounds that are probably more likely to help with that, bisentin okay. being the main one. Yeah. You know, that's found in strawberries. Yeah. And there are supplements on the market, you know, that you can get. Fisetin, one, one of the issues with um, a lot of the polyphenols is bioavailability. Yeah. Because they're kind of large, bulky molecules. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that some supplement companies are looking at trying to make Fisetin more bioavailable. And resveratrol has the same problem. So I think when you're looking at autophagy inducers, what's interesting with spermidine is that it's very bioavailable, whereas something like resveratrol is not. Right. Okay. Well, that's, that's, uh, yeah. And resveratrol, it's funny. It's depending on who you're talking to, it's the thing. And then other people just completely diss it. And, uh, it'll be interesting to see where it all comes out <laughs> in the wash at the end of the, uh, um, at the end of the day. Okay. So one of the things you sent me some notes, which were really helpful before this meeting. Um, and one of the things you referred to were the mechanisms of action of spermidine around autophagy. And you made the distinction between autophagy dependent versus autophagy independent. So why don't we elaborate a little bit on that for the listeners? So I think the autophagy dependent is probably the most well-known. And what I think is interesting is, you know, there are these subsets of autophagy. So there's mitophagy, which right. is, you know, replacing damaged mitochondria. And then there's lipophagy, which has to do with the release of lipids from fat cells. Yep. And, you know, there's virophagy, which has to do with the direct elimination of unwanted viruses. And so autophagy is not just one thing. There's sort of these subsets. And spermidine seems to trigger these. All of which them? Which is very interesting. All of them. All of them, huh. all three of the ones I mentioned. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. And and when you think of um, the the mechanisms of action that are not autophagy dependent, you start thinking about well, what do you need to use to make spermidine endogenously? Mm -hmm. So as we kind of talked about at the beginning, you're using up certain amino acids because it comes from amino acids. So arginine gets converted to ornithine, which gets converted to putrescine and then onto spermidine and spermine. So if you could conserve those amino acids, you know, what else can you do with them? 
-hmm. And the other thing um, you would be conserving would be um, methionine because there is a version of SAMe, which comes from methionine, that is a cofactor for making polyamines. So when you're conserving methionine or SAMe essentially, you have that left over for DNA methylation and all the processes involved with methyltransferase enzymes, right? So you're conserving that. Um, and then if you're conserving your arginine, let's say you would have more arginine to make nitric oxide, which right. we know is important for cardiovascular function and for immune function as well. Mm -hmm. So those are some, some mechanisms of action that might be not related to autophagy. Right. And if so you're increasing, if you're increasing your exogenous intake of spermidine, right. You know, so you're preserving, much right. Right. So you're, you're preserving the, the materials for other uses, if you will, so that you're not constantly using up your own resources. Yeah. Plus the body's going to prioritize, right. Whether or not making spermidine is top priority at any given moment is a question, which yeah. I don't know that we can necessarily answer, but you know, we all know, one thing we know for sure, even though we don't fully understand it, is the, bo the body does things in, in terms of a, whatever hierarchy of needs it determines are the most yes. important, right? So, and I, and I, kind of, I kind of think of spermidine as a conditionally essential nutrient. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so you know, just for your listeners, essential nutrients are the ones that we can't make, the body cannot make. And so you have to get them from food. Right. And then you have a group of nutrients that we say, well, they're conditionally essential, essential because you can make some, but in certain cases, you're maybe not making enough um, for what the body needs, in mm -hmm. which case you need to get more from food. Yeah. And in the case of spermidine, you know, some people have microbes that can, can make some spermidine as well. And do we know what those are yet? Because this is microbiome, right? So in the microbiome, like the microbiome to me, it's like, it's this it's such an incredibly important area of research. And every time you talk to an expert on microbiome, the first thing they'll tell you is we're just scratching the surface, right? So yes, there are microbes in the gut that could be making spermidine, but do we know what they are and how to cultivate them? And how many so people- So we, we, we know a little bit. There's okay. been some research on it. There's actually an excellent paper, I highly recommend everyone to read by Bruno, Ramos Molina at all. And I can give you the, the reference for that later. It's a review paper, but he focuses a lot on, on polyamines and the microbiome. And one thing that they say in that paper is that if, um, I think it's bacteroides and fusobacteria have the right fuel. So if they have the prebiotic fiber and fructans, then they will generate large amounts of polyamines. Huh. So we know that for those, those particular species. And then there was another species um, that they mentioned, which is bifidobacterium animalis. Okay. A particular type of bifidobacterium animalis can also make polyamines. Interesting. Okay. Well, that's interesting, actually, because that degree of, you can get that information from current microbiome assessments. So that's, that's kind of interesting and new information. Yeah, I would love to link to that review um, in the show notes, if I've written sure. it, I've written it down as a reference. So I will. And I, I think, I think what's, what's really interesting about this is that we know that it's important for the development of the intestines in, you know, in babies and in children, they need spermidine and spermidine and polyamines in general are found in breast milk for that reason. Ha. Huh. Okay. Well, evolutionarily, like they're, they seem to be present all the way along, right? Um, I mean, spermidine, the name, it gives us an indication of where you might find a whole lot of it in sperm. And Leslie was mentioning in the interview that we did about how, I don't know if it's been established or if it's believed that spermine or spermidine, that those high concentrations of the sperm and they protect from DNA damage, could it be that they're there for exactly that reason for the, to protect the sperm as it's going through its journey of, you know, making a baby kind of thing. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. And, you know, the other, the you know, two of the main mechanisms of action that of course are so important are anti-inflammatory and antioxidant. Right. Um, so we, we think that it is a reactive oxygen species scavenger. Right. Right to add to the long list of things, wonderful, <laughs> ma magical things that it does. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about spermidine levels um, 
and age. You were you were mentioning a paper to me. I mean, not a very big paper, but you were mentioning a, a small study about where they measured spermidine levels in people. And this was really fascinating because they were talking about there's, you know, this cutoff age of 50, which is interesting because very often in human study where we often use age 30 as the cutoff, right? Because that's kind of when things start to go downhill, if you will. <laughs> but in this particular study, they they talked about spermidine levels. Is it spermidine or yeah, it was spermidine levels being being at a certain level up until the age of 50 where they start to decline. And then in 60 to 80 year olds, they seem to be lower, but then in the 90 and over group, they were more comparable to the 50 to the 50 and unders. And so you and I were talking about how could it be that actually it's the people that make it to over 90 who somehow maintain these healthy spermidine levels and everybody else just kind of fizzles out in the, in the, somewhere in their sixties to eighties. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So that study actually looked at polyamines in general, not just okay. spermidine, okay. but you're absolutely right that it was the, the super agers who seem to have this, these levels in line with younger people. And so why would that be important? Well, as you age, obviously autophagy is important and cleaning up all these kind of old damaged cells, but it's also important to be able to generate new cells, yeah. right? generate cells that you need to, to replace those damaged um, cells that you're getting rid of. And I think that's one thing that declines with aging. So if there's a way that we can do that, you know, and continue to do that at a, a younger person's level, that will lead to healthier aging. Yeah. So that's interesting. And I guess that that's where the supplementation comes in, right? So in that 60 to 80 year old, I mean, or frankly, over 50 crowd, um, and this is one point that Leslie did make um, quite markedly in our in our discussion was about how, you know, the people that are likely to experience the greatest visible result or mo- more noticeable results from s- supplementation with a spermidine supplement are going to be people over the age of 50, or if they're under 50, you know, they've got some kind of an illness. And we were talking earlier about possibly a a role in autoimmune conditions where there's been a a dysregulation of sorts, or you're wanting to preserve those, those starter materials and free them up by this, by exogenously supplementing spermidine. Does that make sense? So in autoimmune disease, they're seeing this upregulation of the polyamine pathway, not in all all autoimmune disease, but in some, in particular, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. Mm -hmm. And from what I've seen in the research, they don't fully yet understand why this is happening. And there might be different theories for why. So one would be, you know, if you think about something like Epstein-Barr virus and Mm -hmm. it being a trigger for certain types of autoimmune disease, maybe that is a signal to the body to upregulate polyamine um, production. Another one could be, um, like we talked about, the fact that if you have tissue destruction going on in these conditions, maybe that is the signal to continue or upregulate polyamine production in these these, um, diseases. The problem is that when you're doing that and it's a constant on button, you're burning through these compounds that we talked about earlier. You're burning through your your amino acids and you're burning through your methionine in particular that's used as the cofactor. Yeah. And then you don't have that for, for DNA methylation and all these other processes. So what is that doing in autoimmune conditions? And this is an area I'm very interested in and I'm, I'm looking at pursuing further research and maybe going on to do my PhD even. <laughs> oh, wow. Interesting. Yeah. Well, but, but it kind of, you know, from, I mean, not that pure logic necessarily applies just because the body is so complex. Like there's so many different pathways, so many different ways for, of for getting from point A to point B, but it certainly having dealt with a lot of, of people with autoimmune issues and this cascade of of consequences that arises from it's never one thing, right? It's always a whole bunch of stuff. And so you can almost see how, if you can start to identify the stresses and strains in the system where you're going, you're burning through these materials, if you can help to replenish them from the outside, you might start to help the body to kind of get back on top of things, which is a very unscientific explanation, but you kind of wonder about that, right? So, so how, no, yeah. yeah, go ahead. 
No, when you look at the associational studies, you know, that's what we see. So these populations that we traditionally think of as, as having these healthy diets, like Japanese population or Mediterranean population, they have higher levels of these polyamine compounds in their diet. And that's associated with favorable outcomes in terms of health span. Right. Right. And even longevity. So let's talk about the foods because, you know, again, I think I talked about this with Leslie and we were talking about this earlier, the, the food that is the highest in this particular polyamine being spermidine is a food that has essentially been knocked out of so many people's diets. Um, and not to mention the fact that even for people that it hasn't been knocked out of, it comes sprayed in glyphosate, like it's been bastardized by big agriculture, right? So it comes with consequences. And what we're talking about is wheat germ, which is the highest source of, of spermidine in diet, even higher than natto. Although natto comes in, I gather, a close second, but natto is soy, which is the next demonized kind of don't ever under any circumstances eat that food. And if you do, if it's not organic, it's been sprayed, it's been genetically modified, like the whole nine yards. So let's talk a bit about these, these food sources and, you know, how, you know, what do we think? Like, basically, can the supplementation start to even make up for that? So it's, it's interesting what you say, because when I first started doing research on this and I was looking at the food sources, I was kind of like, hmm, I'm gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free. I don't eat lectins because of my autoimmune background. Like the only food on the list that I was eating was mushrooms. And I was like, maybe I need to be getting more of this in my diet. Right. Um, and, and I always think, you know, diet you know, as you know, I'm sure supplementation is no substitute for a good diet and diet should always be the foundation. Yep. And the key is like, how do, how do you get some of these foods in your diet without exposing yourself to these anti-nutrients? Mm -hmm. um, so there was a study recently that was interesting on aged foods and cheese in particular. And they were showing that, you know, while these foods might be, you know, good sources of spermidine, let's say, they also tended to be really high in these other biogenic amines that we think are not as healthy, like histamine and tyramine. Yeah. Well, so, so you know, a lot know, of people with histamine issues, a lot, a lot of people with histamine issues. And they were saying what was interesting in the study, just not on spermidine, but separately on histamine and histamine intolerance, that a lot of the products that they measured were way above what we consider to be safety standards for histamine content. <laughs> Of uh, food. Yeah. And so people who are sensitive to histamine might even have symptoms if they only get like five to 10 milligrams, you know, whereas I think the safe, safe upper limit is a hundred. And a lot of these cheeses were coming in at over a hundred milligrams. No kidding. So, yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it's like finding that balance in the diet, you know, finding healthy things that are not causing problems for you in particular. Right. And so, and so, and then there was the, and then also, of course, in the whole food. So if you're going to be eating buckets of wheat germ, there's this whole issue around the, the fat that comes with the wheat germ, right? So, which is a very like omega, these are the omega six fatty acids that are very delicate, not very stable, very prone to becoming rancid really. Um, and so definitely, I know that in the primadine supplement, you Oxford Health Spend definitely takes extra steps to make sure that those are not an issue. Do we want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So, so that's something that I think is really important and something that's quite unique to primidine. So when Leslie was looking, you know, to, to find a source for this, she, she went to the Japanese and the reason she did that is because the Japanese have the highest food safety standards in the world, really. And I'm sure, you know, a lot of your listeners are familiar with the story around coffee, right? You know, the, the best quality coffee gets sent to Japan and the stuff that the Japanese don't want gets sent to the Europeans. And then the stuff that the Europeans don't want gets sent to the United States, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, nice. and so I think, you know, when she was, when she wanted to um, formulate the supplement, she went to the Japanese because she knew that they had the highest safety standards in the world. And they themselves, you know, thought it was really important to take out the omega-6 fats from the supplement because they knew that they would not be shelf stable. 
And I think that is one of the advantages of primating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and definitely there's, um, I mean, and, and omega-6 fatty acids absolutely drive inflammation. That's, it's, you know, I mean, not that we can live without them. We need the good ones, but when they go bad, they go, they take us down with them kind of thing. So yeah, it's, it's an issue. So there is the issue, however, and, and I mean, I'm going to bring this up because, because it is a wheat germ supplement, um, the issue of gluten, of course. And as a person yourself with auto, who's had a history of autoimmune disease and particularly Hashimoto's gluten is definitely not something that we would particularly want to be exposed to. So do you, I personally stay away from gluten and I've not had any issues with primidine, but what have you seen happening in the last little while? Like definitely do you, do you have a sense of, cause it's a very small amount of gluten that's in the supplement. Like, was it like 40 milligrams, but for per dose or something? That's correct. And I, I'm like you, I don't eat gluten intentionally. I've eliminated it from my diet. Um, but being a biohacker, of course, when I was first introduced to this, I'm like, of course, I'm going to try it. It has all these amazing benefits. Let's see what happens. I haven't had any problems mm. with, uh, with primidine in terms of gluten sensitivity. And I think most people that, you know, I know of who have a similar diet that, that we do haven't seemed to have any problems either. I wouldn't go as far as to say that I would recommend this in celiac disease. In fact, we, we do not recommend this in celiac disease. Yeah. Um, and that's something, you know, you should always work with your doctor when choosing any kind of supplement, but personally, you know, as a nutritionist, I would never recommend that someone with celiac disease takes a wheat germ supplement. Um, one thing that is interesting is that because wheat germ does have fructo oligosaccharides in it, mm -hmm. it can be a problem with people who have SIBO. Hmm. Interesting. And we have seen that. So they, so, so like they actually like they get the bloating, like they experience discomfort from it. Yes. So I would say if you have small, back, um, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, if you've been diagnosed with that, then this is probably not the right product for you until you resolve that. Okay. But that's a solvable problem. So yes, in theory. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, fructose oligosaccharides are great, great for the microbiome. Exactly. Well, so that's the paradox, right? And this is, yeah. this is the difficulty with things like SIBO when you're trying to help people with SIBO in your you really want to get to the bottom of it and resolve it because you're, you're forcing their systems to do without elements that are actually part of a healthy diet. Yeah. And, and one, one of the things, you know, we didn't touch on this when we were talking about the microbiome and the intestines, but one of the things that they know is that polyamines are needed for um, proteins that upregulate, you know, tight junctions. So it could be something that's really important for maintaining intestinal permeability. Oh, wow. Yeah. No kidding. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So you got to solve that one problem so that you can get to this other stuff, to the good yes. stuff. Yes. Yeah. And that applies. I mean, as you know, people with SIBO, they can't take any of this prebiotic fiber that is so healthy. You yeah. know, they normally can't tolerate any of the, the quote unquote good vegetables. Yeah. 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 No, the, 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 um, what's it called? The, FODMAP diet, right? That's yes. A, yes. Low FODMAP. Very, very, very restrictive uh, diet, but it's meant to be an intervention, right? It's not, it shouldn't be a forever thing. It's definitely meant to be an intervention. Okay. So let's move into, um, we were talking a little bit about some of the studies in humans because, you know, there's not a lot of studies in humans yet with polyamine and spermidine intakes, but there is some, there's some, there's a little bit out there. So you were talking about some studies that talked about improved cardiovascular health, brain health, lower all cause mortality. So how many, what, which of those can we kind of talk about a little bit today to help people understand maybe some of the things that are happening? You know, we were talking about this earlier, right? Like we talk about the hair, skin and nails, the visible signs that spermidine might be doing its thing, working its thing in your, it's magic, if you will, on your body, but we don't see the autophagy, the misfolded proteins, particularly, like you're not going to wake up one morning and going, oh, I think more of my proteins are folded properly today, <laughs> like, just because it doesn't work that way. But, um, but what are the, like, what are those studies that, that have been done in humans that can give us some insight into 
some of the more systemic benefits, if you will. So in humans, you have the two types of studies. You have the epidemiological studies, and there have been quite a few of those, actually. And then you have the clinical trials. So okay. if we look at the, at the epidemiological studies, um, the first one that I'm aware of was in 2012. The, ja the Japanese wanted to look at all these different populations around the world, and they wanted to see you know, whether polyamines you know, had any impact on health, basically. Yeah. And one of the reasons, my understanding is that one of the reasons the Japanese were very interested in polyamines early on was that the traditional Japanese diet contained a lot of them and that they were seeing this uptick in allergic disease in Japan. And they wanted to know if it was because <laughs> people weren't eating these traditional foods anymore, which is quite interesting. Oh, because they weren't eating them. Okay. Because, cool. they weren't, they, because there was a reduction, you know? Yeah. And so they showed that, you know, people who had more polyamines, I think that study was on polyamines in general, in the diet had improved cardiovascular health. And a few years later, Eisenberg um, went on to show that people who, who had more spermidine intake had lower blood pressure on average and lower incidence of cardiovascular disease. Huh. And then there was a really interesting study in 2018. Um, the lead author's name is Kikel, which I think is spelled K-I-E-C-H-L. And what I liked about that study was that it was very large. So they had, they looked at, I think, 829 people mm -hmm. in the cohort. And they weren't looking for polyamines in particular. You know, they gave them this food questionnaire that had like 118 items and they had all of these different nutrients, um, over 100 nutrients. And they wanted to see, you know, which ones were associated with um, an inverse relation with mortality. Yeah. And the number one nutrient was spermidine intake. Really? So I thought that was really interesting. They found, um, it was interesting, they found that women had higher intakes than men. And they found that, you know, intakes, you know, intakes from food, right, <laughs> declined with, with age. So that's a bit sad because we know that endogenous production declines with age. And, you know, it seems like people are eating less with age as well. You mean so, you know, if we could, food or of these foods? I think of, of spermidine, right? That they, they had lower, older people had lower levels in their diet. Interesting. So, you know, if you can, if you can replace, like we've talked about, if you can replace that, that lack of endogenous production with either food or supplements, you know, that could be very helpful for aging. For sure. Um, and the, o the other interesting thing about that study was that they also corrected for potential confounders. You know, so it was a very well done study. So, you know, they corrected for age and BMI and alcohol intake and all these other things that could potentially, you know, be confounding their results. So I think that was, you know, in terms of the associational studies, that's one that I really like. Yeah. And it's, and it's got scale too. Yeah. Like, you know, 829 people is nothing to sneeze at. It's not like that 15 person study we were talking about earlier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then the, the, the most recent one um, was actually a, an associational study they did in conjunction with one of the clinical trials. So the, the only published clinical trial right now, well, actually there's two, but what, the first one is called the SMART Age Cohort. So they're looking at cognition. But while they were doing this, they did an associational study as well. And they were able to show that those people who had higher spermidine intakes had increased cortical thickness and hippocampal volume in the brain. Never separate from separate from the, the intervention trial that they did. Yeah. So the, I guess, so what's the next step in research on spermidine is then to say is to supplement people and to see what happens. So that's what's happening, right? So okay. that smart age cohort, then they've gone on now. Well, first they did a safety study. So, so that's good to know. I mean, it was small, but at least they showed that for 90 days, it seems to be safe and well tolerated. And then they, they took a very small group of subjects and they gave them an intervention of 1.2 milligrams of spermidine from concentrated wheat germ as well. Okay. And over a 90 day period, and they saw improvements in memory test performance. Really? Yeah. Okay. That's the, so that's the human clinical study on brain health with spermidine. Yes, that's one of them. And then actually there was, there was another one. That one was in 2018. 
And then there was a more recent one just published in 2020, which was in my eyes is slightly more interesting. It's kind of a strange study design, but they took, um, they had, I think 92 people and they were in these nursing homes, six different nursing homes. So what's interesting there is people in nursing homes are getting the same diet right? Yeah. Yeah. in the same nursing homes are getting the same diet. And what they did, I think they were worried about compliance. So they actually put the spermidine into these bread rolls <laughs> that they served them. <laughs> so, and they had two different dosages. They had two, two different dosages. So a high dose versus a low dose. So I think the high dose was 3.3 milligrams and the lower dose was 1.9 milligrams. And this was over a three month period. And they saw cognitive performance um, increases in, in all of their subjects actually. Really? The, in the low dose and the high dose? In the low dose and the high dose. But, yeah. the, but the high dose seemed to even have benefit in those who might have had, let's call it, um, uh, brain deficits. Right, 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 right. That's fascinating. That's really, that, that actually is quite encouraging. That's encouraging me to just keep taking it. Um, and actually, you know, as I told you before, like I've had my, I've gotten my parents um, using Primadine now since I'm going to say, well, I guess since the beginning of the, the beginning of this year. So not really all that long and, um, and unsolicited, my dad mentioned that my mom's hair was looking really good. And he actually wanted to know, is there any kind of, in all those things that you send us, Nat, because I'm always sending them something, um, you know, is there something that could have changed your mother's hair? And I'm like, yeah, no, as a matter of fact, there is. And, but I've got them doubling down on their dose. So just my logic being again, you know, with people who are older and, and who, and of course I've been browbeating these poor people into giving up their bread for years now. And so, you know, their spermidine, their nutritional intake of spermidine has plummeted like everybody else's. Um, but definitely it's, it's an interesting, it was really interesting. Like, it's not like I said to my dad, okay, watch mom's hair and see how she, if anything changes kind of thing. So it's always, it's always quite exciting as the, you know, a biohacker, when you start to get that kind of feedback from people, that's, you know, we take a lot of really amazing supplements, but you don't always notice or see a difference. And it's always kind of fun when you start to see evidence that there might be something actually going on there. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's right. And I mean, my own experience with taking it has been really interesting. So I think because I, I actually had undiagnosed Hashimoto's for many years because my first, my first signs of Hashimoto's disease were when I was 18 and I got a goiter that kind of went then untreated for many years. Huh. And I think in my case, it had a negative impact on my cardiovascular function. Okay. And the way I see that is through um, HRV. So right. when I first got the aura ring several years back, I was like, I'm so healthy, but so why is my HRV so low? I don't understand. Like, why, why do I have this really low baseline HRV? You know, is this right? You know, are they measuring it right? This can't be right. Yeah. yeah. You know, cause I was getting 20 and lower were my scores for HRV. Oh, when wow. I first started that is ring. Yeah. And of course, you know, being a biohacker, then I'm like, well, we have to fix this. Right. Absolutely. And this is a fact. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I've done many things over the year to kind of try to bring it up. And, you know, it's been a kind of a struggle, I have to say. And I've started with everything like, you know, the biofeedback training and, you know, I've done many different things, peptides, you know. Yeah. And so when I started taking primidine, I started getting these high H HRV scores and almost immediately, you know, it was really strange. And I was like, wait, why is my HRV so high today? Like what's going on? And it yeah. took me a while to put it together. And I actually did a lot of biohacking around it where I would go off primidine for a whole month and then try to go back on. And there's definitely, it's definitely having an impact, which is very interesting to me and intriguing and not surprising given, given what we've seen in animals in terms of cardiovascular function when they supplement them with spermidine, but we don't have that research yet in humans to know what's going to happen. That's just my personal experience. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. The HRV is is very interesting. You also mentioned something about um, bone and joint protection, and you mentioned that there were there was uh, there were a couple of in vivo and in vitro studies, and also some customer feedback. Do you want to? Because that'll be so, the next that'll be the next phone call. I'll be very interested to get from my parents. And I have, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> these poor people. Like I'm not telling them 
watch for this or watch for that. I'm just waiting to see what comes up kind of thing. So So there was a a really interesting animal study that, that came out in 2020 where they had these mice and they, it was a menopause model for a mouse. So they took out their ovaries essentially. Yeah. Overectomized. I believe. Overectomized. Yes. And, and then they put them in a heated environment. So I think it was like 34 degrees Celsius for, I can't remember for how long, but they, they made them live in this 34 degrees Celsius environment. And they could see by doing that, this upregulated the microbial production of spermidine. Really? And that upregulation had a positive impact on bone health. And what was even cooler was what then they took these poor mice, but they took the, they, they basically did a fecal microbiome transplant. Oh my God. In a mouse model yeah. and that hadn't been exposed to the heat. And that had the protective effect on bone as well. So taking the fecal, but taking the fecal matter from the heat exposed mice and yes. putting it in the not heat exposed mice. So somehow that affected the microbiome in a way to upregulate production of spermidine from that route. Yes. Interesting. And so you do, you, well, I'm, I, there's no way we can possibly extrapolate this to sauna or can we? I don't know. Because these poor little sauna, mice were- sauna, like, sauna certainly doesn't hurt. <laughs> Well, no, sauna, it, certain, but, sauna certainly doesn't hurt for so many reasons. I, I sauna regularly and I will continue to do so. It would be interesting now for someone to do a study in humans where they put them in sauna. Then, you know, how would you be able to measure all this? I'm not 100% sure, but look and see whether that increased microbial production of spermidine and what impact that would have. That would be a really interesting study. Yeah, well, because you said earlier, we kind of have a handle and at least some of the microbes that are responsible for producing spermidine. So, you know, from stool samples, you might be able to do a before, you know, an, in, an intense run of sauna, let's say. I mean, I don't know, maybe 30 days or something, but I, mean, <laughs> I don't think you'll find too many. I mean, you do have populations of people who live in very hot climates. So again, I mean, it's, this is also new, right? Nobody's kind of, we're now finding 27 different ways to split this pie and, and all the different things you could be looking at. Yeah. And we know that sauna is beneficial for cardiovascular function. Yeah. Right. They have all those studies out of Finland. So it's like, maybe this is another mechanism of action for why it's beneficial, but we don't know that yet. No. Um, we don't know that yet. And what is interesting, you know, there, there are researchers at Oxford who've been looking at this. So a researcher called Gada Al-Saleh published a paper recently. Um, it is in vitro, right? So now we're going even a step back where we're looking at a Petri dish, but she was looking at um, human hip tissue from people who had had hip replacement. Mm-hmm. And she could see that when she, when she added spermidine to that hip tissue, it would grow the tissue. So, you know, these are the early studies that are then going to be eventually translated into human studies and hopefully give us some more answers as to what's happening. Yeah. Well, it's going to be, yeah. I mean, it's funny. It's like we're hopping on the train at the beginning of the, uh, at the beginning of the ride here, but there doesn't seem to be any signs that there's any downside at this point that, that we've heard of. I mean, I, I couldn't find anything that talked about toxic levels until you got to 450 milligrams per kilo dose, which is, well, for one thing would be prohibitively expensive. Um, And only then did the little mice kind of start to experience some negative effects, but it seems, and I know that the maximum dose that's cleared right now from the I guess from the NIA, I don't know what the, the regulatory board is. I think the, the highest, highest dose is six milligrams and I don't know if too many people using that, but so one milligram seems to be totally, everybody's pretty comfortable with that one. Um, But it seems that, you know, from a supplementation perspective, there's not too much downside other than the gluten issue for people that are extremely sensitive to gluten. I think, I think the nice thing about a supplement like primidine, which is from food, yeah. You know, like you said, it's, you're just supplementing your diet with a food-based supplement. It has a very low dose of spermidine, um, 1.2 milli- milligrams, which is the dosage that was used in the safety study. 
Yeah. And um, I think, like you said, you know, that we're going to find out more in the coming years about what dosage is optimal. Mm -hmm. The European Food Safety Agency, like you said, has said probably up to six milligrams is safe. It probably depends on how much you're actually getting in your diet. Yeah. You know, so people, you know, the standard American diet is supposed to have like only 10 milligrams of spermidine or something like that. Yeah. So, you know, maybe yeah. if you're having that diet, you know, you need more. And maybe if you're eating a Japanese diet, you know, you need less. Do we have a sense of what a traditional Japanese diet level would be? Do we know that? I don't think I have that data yet. Um, I do have data on the American diet being 10 milligrams, the European, oh, actually American diet, only eight milligrams. Sorry, I misspoke. European diet, maybe 13 milligrams. I mean, this is from one study, so, you know, we can't no. know for sure. But, and then something like a Mediterranean diet, you're going up to closer to 26 milligrams. Interesting. So I would, I would assume the Japanese diet is, is at least that, if not higher. Okay. All right. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, no. And that is a very interesting thing about this supplement in that it's a food-based supplement. You know, I interviewed another researcher recently on another supplement that in another vein, that's all about um, helping to restore the pathway that recycles NAD in the mitochondria. And mm -hmm. It was interesting because when I looked at the, I, myself and another good friend of mine, who's a biohacker, we looked at the ingredients on the bottle and we were like, there's nothing here that's blowing me away. You know, there was like, you know, there were, I don't, well, actually I have it right here. You know, you had, you had this vitamin C, then you had niacin, some zinc, and then there's this botanical proprietary blend with like what looks like just foods. Right. And so I recorded the podcast with the researcher and she started laughing and we went through every one of these ingredients under this botanical blend. And she started explaining exactly that, well, yes, we use the whole food source of this, whatever it is, because it, it becomes more bioavailable. If you mm -hmm. synthesize this in a lab and try to reintroduce it into the body, it doesn't get to, it's not going to get to where it needs to go. So you know, whenever, whenever we can get to this place where we're actually able to maintain the integrity of, of the compound almost in its natural environment, is it possible that the body is then going to be better able to recognize and process it the way we, we hope that it will? I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I'm actually, I'm dying to know what else you guys are working on now. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have to fly over to London someday and <laughs> Leslie's arm. <laughs> um, okay. So um, I guess just to finish off, like, are there any other, is there any other feedback that you've gotten from customers now? Like, so how long is the, has Primadine been out? I'm, I'm, I know it's relatively new, but how long has it been in the market? I think Leslie officially launched it in June. It was either late June or early July. Okay. I started working with her around the same time and that's around the time they launched. Okay. Yeah. And so do you, are you like, are you, do you see the reports coming back from, from happy or unhappy customers? Like, would you say, is there anything that stands out for you in terms of, of some of the feedback you've gotten from people using Primadine for, you know, more than 10 days, like for a couple of months or. Yeah, I think, that, I mean, there's so many interesting things. Like you said, the, the one that's obvious to everyone is the hair and the eyelashes and the nail improvement. That seems to be um, pretty consistent. Yeah. And most people have those positive benefits. Mm -hmm. um, HRV, I think, you know, in my case, it was very significant. Most people are not reporting that. And I think it's because I had a deficit in that area. It, I was going to say exactly that because my HRV has been pretty good. Like I'm sometime last year, it got better than it had been before. So I haven't really noticed much change in my HRV, but it is interesting that yours being so yeah, almost suppressed. strangely <laughs> suppressed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sleep is another one where we seem to get a lot of positive feedback. So a lot mm -hmm. of people seem to get improvements in their deep sleep in particular, especially people who can measure it with something like aura ring. Yeah. You know, if you're just subjectively saying, am I sleeping better? I'm not sure you would notice it, but people with aura ring seem to be getting more deep sleep. I don't know if you, have you had any of that? Yeah. So what I found, and I now have two devices <laughs> measuring my sleep with only because I'm, I'm testing another one called the BioStrap. Um, and now BioStrap doesn't separate out 
deep and REM. It just reports on deep, which I actually think is what Aura is reporting is splitting into deep and REM. They just put together in one. But what I found is that whether it's, it's certainly on Aura, what's happened is that my deep sleep has become more consistent. So, and it seems to be a little more resilient when it comes to me doing silly things that I shouldn't do before bed. (laughs) <laughs> where in the past, my deep sleep might have really tanked and I'm seeing it be a little bit more resistant, if you will, to some of that stuff, as long as I'm not, you know, totally off the rails. But things like eating too late always mess up my deep sleep. It doesn't matter what supplement I'm taking. I'm not going to. And that makes sense. You know, like if your body's digesting, nothing's going to take that away. But, you know, maybe staying up a little too late, having a little more, not, not wearing my blue blockers as consistently, Although that almost gives me a headache now. I'm so used to them at night. <laughs> I, I almost can't tolerate not wearing them. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that my deep sleep has become more, more, more consistent. I'm like you, I'm getting amazing sleep efficiency. Yes. So when Aura Ring has this measure of sleep efficiency on nights where I might get less than I should, like five hours or six hours, I'm still getting my at least 20% deep and my at least 20% REM, which is quite unusual. I was definitely wasn't getting that before. So I think that's really interesting. I think some of the longer term effects, we're starting to see more people report these now. Uh-huh. So that's things like reduction in visceral fat or belly fat. Huh. Um, some women are saying they're losing their cellulite, which I think is interesting. Um, and then optimization and markers like cholesterol or blood pressure, let's say. So yeah. it's becoming optimized over time. Interesting. So actually another interesting one that I had recently, which was kind of a more of a long-term effect, I used to have these thread veins on my shin. And I looked down and I'm like, oh, wow, they're gone. Really? Is that, is that primidine? I mean, I don't know, but I can't imagine what else it would be. I thought it was very interesting. That is interesting. So yeah, that, so that is interesting, you know, being on this beginning journey with you guys and, and seeing the, the feedback starting to come back from people as the studies are starting, as more and more clinical studies are starting to be done. Like this is, you know, it's amazing to me that you are able to report on, on a study that was done in 2018, another one in 2020. Like this is clearly an active, I mean, it's shocking that anything came out in 2020. <laughs> 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 other than the current pandemic and anything pandemic related. But um, but it is so interesting that it's such an active area of study right now. Anti-aging, I guess, and optimization front. Yeah, I think that was it. I think that's, I mean, we're pretty much at the end of my questions for you. So is there anything I've missed, Amy? Is there anything else we want to talk about? Or I don't think so. I mean, I think it's an exciting area. Like you said, I think anti-aging, health span longevity, that is really the future, right? Yeah. People are going to be focused on that. And we're going to be focused more on these things that are having, you know, an effect on the whole system, right? Not a pill for an ill anymore, like things that are actually mm-hmm. moving the whole system. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be really fun to, to watch where the research goes with all of that. Yeah, no, it's inter- actually, that's such an interesting point, right? That we're shooting for effects further and further upstream rather than downstream. And so then you just kind of sit back and watch the cascade of what comes from that. And that's yeah. uh, that's very powerful. And that's a really interesting area. Well, okay. Well, thank you again so much for getting up so early and talking to me today. We're, we're pretty much 12 hours apart, right? So it was going to be my night, your morning or the other way around. So I appreciate you doing this so early in the morning and taking the time. And um, I'm looking forward to talking to you again when you guys launch your next magical supplement. <laughs> that sounds great, Natalie. It was so great to finally meet you. Yes. And you as well. Actually, um, so one last thing is to find to follow Amy why don't you tell us what's your Instagram account and is there any other way that people can connect with you if they have any questions or. So my, my Instagram account is at Amy Lamott and I am working on my website right now, which will be coming soon, which will also be Amy Lamott.com on Twitter. I post really nerdy studies, (laughs) um, very science level, high science level. So if you are interested in that, that's, I think that's Amy Lamott 88 
And I'm now on Clubhouse, partially because of you and, and some others. That, so hopefully I'll be doing some fun things there. And I'm also Amy Lamott on Clubhouse. Okay. Well, we should do something on Clubhouse together. Although I do, I have to admit, I have a love-hate relationship with Clubhouse <laughs> myself. It's You have to educate me. I'm okay. New. Yeah, we'll spend some time on that. And, um, and also for the listeners, uh, we have a really amazing promo code with Primadine. So the website is primadine.com and it's exactly as it sounds, the word prime and then A-D-I-N-E at the end.com and Bionat 15 actually will save you 15% off your, um, off your full order. So thank you again, Amy, and we'll speak again soon. Thanks. Bye. Thanks so much for joining me on this episode of the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please remember to leave us a five-star review on iTunes because that's what helps us to be heard and to be seen. If you'd like to connect with me directly, or if you'd like to leave any comments, or if you have any questions about this episode, please reach out to me directly through my website, natnidham.com. And of course, if you're not already a member of the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Community on Facebook, that's where you'll find me every day. It's a short application. Just answer a couple of questions and you're in and interfacing with other amazing biohackers. Thanks again. And we'll look forward to seeing you on the next episode.